Hello and welcome to another YPAC check-in. I'm your host, Sean Davido, and today I'm joined by Lieutenant Chad Janice of the Yakima Police Department. Thanks for joining me today, Chad. Oh, you're very welcome. Glad to be here. Now, today we're going to talk about a new program that uh, you are involved with and that several other people are involved with. We've talked a little bit about it. It's called the Handle with Care program, correct? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so Handle with Care is a program we're rolling out with the Yakima School District with the assistance of ESD 105 Educational Service District uh, and Comprehensive Healthcare. And so what it is, it's uh, last spring, the Yakima Police Department in, uh, came together with City Legal Department and the YWCA Advocacy and the, and the County Prosecutor's Office to really start diving into why we had such high rates of domestic violence in the city of Yakima. Uh, as some people may know that we're closely on this issue, Yakima, the city of Yakima has uh, some of the highest rates of domestic violence of any city in the state, regardless of the population of the other cities. So, so that is to say that even though we're a city of about 94,000, we have more domestic violence than cities that are much larger than us, uh, both per capita and by total number. So there are, there are several different factors at, in play as we start as we started to identify how we could better address domestic violence within the city. And one of the things that really was in the back of my mind was how can we intervene and offer a preventative measure that was further upstream than the problem that our police officers were dealing with. So what, you know, what police officers really do well is we, we respond and we react to crime. And so we identify whether or not something is a crime, we investigate, that is, that is really the, the basis of what policing is. We're, we're an investigative source for the community that of course has uh, a great deal of authority. But what we do best is, is respond to what's happening right now. Where we need assistance is preventing it, preventing it from happening. And so that means really looking upstream from where the problem is and looking for the root causes and where you can make meaningful impact. And when I was a detective, I, I often wondered like, how can we get upstream from a lot of these issues within our community? Because you know, we're so, our hands are so tied dealing with the problem as it occurs that we don't really get to spend a lot of time talking about how we can make an impact or prevent it from happening. And so one of the things that that's really, really clear is, is there's a significant impact to children that live in homes where there is domestic violence. On our um, YPD, Yakima Police.org website, anybody can go to the information hub and they can track our, the different things that we measure in intimate partner violence on the intimate partner violence dashboard. And what we know, and we started this dashboard in July of this year. And so we've had 780 total incidents of domestic violence, uh, intimate partner violence since then. And what we know is that there were 145 children present at those cases. So we know there is the potential for children to be traumatized by these events. And so how can we help them? What can we do as a police department and luckily, we, we have a really good working relationship with the Yakima School District. And so when we started this program, I met with one of the super, assistant superintendents at the school district and just asked if they would be a part of the domestic violence project. At that time, it was a project. We didn't really know where, what direction it was going to go or, or what the end result was. We just knew we wanted to talk about it with as many community partners as possible. Yakima School District was like, absolutely, we're in. We don't know where we fit into this project, but we know we're in. And as we initially started talking, you know, one of the things we talked about is like, what if there was a way every time our police officers went to a domestic violence call, children were present, that we could notify the school of that? Because there's going to be an impact. The likelihood of there being an impact the following school day is significant. We know that a majority of our domestic violence crimes happen in the evenings, late into the night. We know that there are other factors at play like substance abuse, alcohol abuse, um, any number of issues within the home. 
And if a child is there and it's a Wednesday night and they have school at eight o'clock Thursday morning and the police are in this home investigating what's happened in the home at midnight, there's just a really high likelihood that that school day is gonna be a little tough on the kid. And so um, as the pro project uh, kept going, we talked more and more about it. We met with our partners over in Spokane that have Domestic Violence Coalition. They said, hey, on that topic, we do this thing called Handle with Care. We're like, what is that? Every time their officers go to a DV call, they check a box when children are present. It gives the school district an address. The school district in Spokane references it by any children that are attending Spokane schools. And we're like, we want that. We don't, we, we don't quite know where this is gonna go, but we know we want that. And so, uh, our city IT department was extraordinary. They built uh, a notification system where every morning, myself and a, a school district official receive a report. It's called a Handle with Care report. It has the names and address of children that were impacted by a traumatic event within the previous 24 hours, because we know in that first 24 hours and is when you can make the most meaningful difference in a person's life that's experiencing crisis. And so every day at seven o'clock, we receive a report of children's names and addresses uh, within the city of Yakima that experienced some sort of traumatic event in the previous day. And so uh, the school district just finished up a pilot project in the first couple of months of school. What we know is about 168 names are on the list. And uh, they are addressing how to best handle that at their level and and the big thing is it's just not the initial step is just to watch is a problem occurring with this child were they absent were they present did they act out in a way that needs a little extra assistance did they bring their homework to school and little things like that could mean the world a difference if for a kid that you know nobody is asking them to talk about it the school district isn't pulling them out of class and further traumatizing them they're just watching and providing an available resource if the need arises. So kind of in a, in a, in a reader digest version, that's, that's handle with care. Right. And you said something when we were talking before, police officers are used to responding to trauma and being in traumatic events. These kids aren't necessarily, some of them are more used to it than we want to, you know, than we want to admit sometimes, but they're not uh, equipped to handle it like police officers are, right? Um, it's a pretty delicate situation. Oh, absolutely. You know, every day people call 911, police officers respond. More often than not, those are a traumatic event for the person that's called 911. It's certainly an emergency, whether it's a burglary, a break into a home, a car, uh, an assault, a fight, or any number of, of offenses that occur that require a police respond to. And it's traumatizing for the people experiencing it. That's, that's the reason they called for help. And so a police officer, albeit they're, they're trained to address trauma, I mean, it certainly takes its toll on, on police officers as well. But that's, that's what they're trained to do. They're trained to respond to it, provide the appropriate resource in the event, whether that means somebody has to go to jail or the police report has to be written or referring them to a resource within the community. Uh, but children, on the other hand, they don't get the choice. They, uh, they, they have the parents they have, they have the home they have, whether they're biological parents, adoptive parents, step parents, so on forth down the line. Um, and they're kind of stuck there, so to speak. And so we needed to create a mechanism that those kids that are being impacted by these traumatic events have a resource and that, that they know that the entire community from the police department to the school districts are working together to provide them a resource that can help them in their moment of need if that arises. Now you've been working, it sounds like you've been working on this program for a little while. You've got some pilot stuff going. Uh, what are some other efforts that are being made to uh, ensure that this program will be successful? Um, well, it's, it's, it takes a community is the best way to say it. Um, one of the things that we wanted to ensure that it, that it just wasn't a police project, that it just wasn't a law enforcement effort or a Yakima Police Department effort. Um, 
that it was a community driven effort that anybody, any stakeholder within the community of Yakima that is capable of making meaningful change to all of these families that are impacted by domestic violence are at the same table and talking about it. And so what happens is I, you've heard me mention this 24 hour response and that's really what we built. And so every 24 hours at seven o'clock every morning, there's a group of stakeholders that come together to triage all of the domestic violence reports that have occurred in the previous 24 hours at about 8.15 every day. They get on a Zoom call, they talk about it, and those are everything from police officers, mental health providers, uh, probation officers, prosecutors, and they identify what is best in each one of these situations. Uh, and some of those are non-criminal events. And so they, they required the police to break up a family dispute. And so, you know, we're really done at the, at the moment that we leave the house, but a commun another community resource like a, a domestic violence advocate may more appropriately handle that situation or there, it may intersect with mental health issues. And so maybe the mental health partners at Comprehensive are better suited to handle the situation. So it's a robust working group that every day is addressing what's happened the day before, as opposed to we would receive a report, we would do whatever we needed to do to address the investigation. Um, maybe we would send the report over to Child Protective Services if, if it required us to do so, or maybe there was a, a DCR designated crisis responder that responded to the original call with the officer. But now all of those community partners every day are addressing what's happened in the previous 24 hours on a daily basis. And we're going to actually uh, work on a little video program to help uh, educate some of the, the people involved with this and, and inform some of the teachers and, and some of the people uh, in the school district and, and throughout the community, right? Correct. We are. Uh, we've asked you to give us give us a hand in this uh, and use your expertise to develop a training video that'll be used for all of the teachers within the Yakima School District, and then we'll we'll probably you know use it for other instructional purposes, both within the school district and within the community, and it'll be posted on our YouTube once we're finished with it. Uh, and what that will be is will be the police department, comprehensive health care, and then the Yakima School District talking about each step of handle with care, what happens when the patrol officer responds, when it's appropriate for them to refer a case to handle with care, and then what happens at the school district level. And then really we'll have the comprehensive folks to talk about, you know, the impact of trauma within the community, what adverse childhood experiences are, how, why building resiliency measures are so important in a community. Because even though somebody is impacted by a traumatic event in their life, it doesn't mean that their life is over. What it means is, is that we have to build resiliency within this community and within that person so that they can go on to live a normal life. And the impact of that one or a series of traumatic events doesn't dictate the outcome of their life down the road. And it's about protecting the kids. Ultimately, it's, it's about our children and, and making sure they're safe and that they can grow up and live a healthy and happy life. Absolutely. Now, we've talked about a lot of stuff. How can people find information? What information is out there? How can people help in situations like this? Well, one of the things that we immediately, we immediately publicly said when we started addressing domestic violence is that we have to normalize talking about the impact of it. We have to make it okay to talk about when domestic violence is occurring. Because what we know is in our most serious domestic violence cases, some of them that have resulted in death, people knew there was a problem and for whatever reason, a variety of them, really good reasons, chose not to tell somebody, chose not to seek help for that friend, that loved one, that family member that was being impacted. And so we have, as a community, to really address this, we have to normalize talking about the violence that's occurring in some of our homes. And that's okay. There's somebody in this community that can help them. And it doesn't always mean somebody needs to go to jail. It just could mean that they need a little help. And if, if people are in a situation and you do know about domestic violence, please, please report it. It is, it's a serious thing. And if you 
hide it and sweep it under the rug. Like you say, it's got to be normalized and it's a serious problem. And people, people do get very seriously impacted, especially our children, like we're talking about right now. Um, we've covered a lot. Chad, what else, what else do we need to talk about in, in this program or whatever else you would like to talk about? Well, you had mentioned, you know, where can the public find information about this? Um, there's a couple places. We are, we are slowly adding stuff to our, um, our website at yakimapolice.org. Uh, we have the Intimate Partner Violence Dashboard up, which is very informative. Um, we will additionally add the video that we create for the school district. Uh, we, we have a really strong partnership with the YWCA and Yakima and Aspen Victim Services, which are the two community-based advocacy groups within the city of Yakima. And those are really easy to find. Uh, we'll have their information posted on our website. As you can tell on Yakima Facebook, Yakima Police Department Facebook this year, we have an illustration of our partnership as our profile photo. And so, you know, what we're really emphasizing is that this is a this is a community driven project. That's all great information. Um, I want to thank you for letting me be involved with this, first of all, and asking for me to help because it is such a such a important thing for us to protect our children and to protect those families and to uh, make sure that everybody's safe and that we're a happy community. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Thank you for joining me today, Chad, and thank you all for joining us.